Today is the third Sunday of Easter, uh, April 26, 2020. And our re first reading is during the Easter season from Acts chapter 2, verses 14a, and then verses 36 through 41. Our psalm is 116, 1 through 4, and 12 through 19. And our epistle is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 through 23. And our gospel is Luke 24, verse 13 through 35. And that's one of my favorites, but I forgot last week to do This Day in History. And in the midst of our quarantine reality, this day in history, April 26, is the day that they began the polio vaccines, uh, which I thought was kind of uh, timely to, to be marked today. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a much uh, loved story, isn't it? The road to Emmaus for a lot of uh, different reasons. And I think um, one thing that I was uh, drawn to is uh, just the, the narrative space that it takes uh, to go for the disciples to go from recognition or lack of recognition of who Jesus is to, to this uh, recognition and the necessity for intervention <laughs> on the part of Jesus to, uh, to, you know, to open up the scriptures. Uh, and I heard that this time around, particularly in our circumstances of that we don't have the usual, the usual realities around us that help us see Jesus. Uh, we don't have the opportunities to go to church. Uh, we don't have our, our, you know, the usual sort of ecclesial rituals uh, that we kind of count on to to see Jesus in our lives or to meet Jesus, you know, meet Jesus and other people, uh, to experience uh, the risen Christ in the context of worship. And uh, so I heard this story as, uh, and, and how we are all kind of in this place of, how do I see Jesus now? How do I recognize where Jesus is when I don't have those usual, uh, usual realities and possibilities around me? So I, I guess I heard in this story, this, uh, in this particular time and place, uh, the promise of Jesus' intervention and uh, that, uh, that, that it's okay to be in that lack of recognition for a little while. Uh, uh, but the promise is that, uh, that, that we will get a glimpse of recognition later uh, and, and just to trust that, uh, that Jesus will intervene. So maybe, it's, uh, maybe that could be one homiletical direction is, is the way in which this story is uh, narrating real life right now uh, in, terms of, in terms of that, uh, the situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the, the way the story sounds different this year. So I, I mentioned this in the Dear Working Preacher article that I wrote for the week, but it's got elements of life that we miss uh, in it. Things like travel, things like the ability to engage a stranger, uh, a shared meal that, uh, that we really miss. And so it, it has these, the, the helps, right? The, the, the framework that allows these two people, Cleopas and his companion, to recognize Jesus. It's, it's not there. But what we do still have is the, the hilarity of the story, the, the, the craziness of the story and the move from sadness and resignation and deep disappointment to this moment of utter surprise. And I mean, I'll say hilarity, even though it's not necessarily narrated there, uh, but to try to imagine that moment of discovery and there is there a kind of upending of the powers. It's a real fitting end to this gospel when we compare it to something like the Magnificat all the way back in Luke chapter one in terms of what Mary is, is hoping for, right? The embarrassment of those with power and then here uh, where death itself is overcome and, and the will of the rulers is overcome. So that's still real and that's still something worth uh, talking about, especially in a time where a lot of us feel quite powerless.
I'm struck with uh, the uh, to to find that hilarity from hindsight. Uh, our reading of this, where um, they're having this conversation about the news. I mean, you know that 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 exchange of like, you know, are you like the only person who hasn't been paying attention to what everybody's talking about that happened last weekend? And everybody right now, we're all in this um, consumption of the same news, the same story. And uh, so there they were. And, and when they were given this opportunity, uh, I like to say to, to tell God what God already knew. Uh, this invitation, you know, where Jesus says, what things? You know, it's like, really? Oh, I mean, we know who's having this conversation. They don't. So from our reading, it is hilarious. And, and then that, that exchange where they start by saying, well, this is the news report. This, this are the facts that we know. But then what slips in is what they had hoped. Is that, but we thought that he was the one. And then the explanation that they are given is from their past. It is, these are the things that scripture has shared with you. These are the promises that God has always offered to you. Do you not recognize what has already been told that is happening right here and now? And that, that pulling together of the events of the day and the promises that they were familiar with is for me just an incredible moment in that story. And then the fact that it does end not in uh, what we are struggling with right now, but a sacrament, but it ends in a regular meal where it seems that Jesus does something that they have seen Jesus do so many times before. He breaks bread and they've seen him share food and he gives thanks. And it's like then that they go, oh my goodness, we know who you are. I, I just find that enlightening moment incredible. I, um, <clears throat> I think uh, that's really helpful. To me, that what really strikes me in the passage is that um, Christ is made known in their home. The, the big thing that's, uh, the big thing Caroline, maybe you didn't know this, but not every time there's bread in the New Testament, is it a sacrament? So that's one of Caroline's familiar uh, lines to me, just in case people didn't recognize that. The, um, so one of the things that I hear from pastors now, um, uh, we're, we're during this time of isolation and uh, quarantining, really, is um, that... Um, they have worked to help people really um, take charge of their spiritual life within their own homes and that they've reached out and equipped people. And actually it's really a, a time of spiritual growth for people. Um, to, uh, my own church sends out a daily uh, devotional for people to use in their homes. And so, what the, so that's really what stands out that um, they say this, right? You know, it's um, first of all, that they recognize God's presence, Christ's presence in their life um, in the breaking of the bread. And we can do that in our own house. And it doesn't have to be a sacrament, but as we talk about God and are open to God's and, and open our, eye God, our eyes to Christ's presence um, as we talk with each other about it. But then they say, we're not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us. We can, each person can do that in their home, right? To take charge of not just going to church to have the pastor interpret the Bible and expound on it for them, but we can, uh, people can do it in their own homes. And I would be remiss if I also did not mention that there's uh, my friends, Michael and George lost and found have a great song called hearts on fire, which people can I'm sure find on the YouTube, uh, which is about this and just all the places uh, they use it really to read back into the gospel to, to just to think about all the occasions when people's hearts were on fire as Christ's presence was made known to them. Well, I think that that connection, Rolf, that you make about about the uh, and you, Joy, as well about the sharing of the meal in the home, I think, will really resonate with people this year. I mean, we have a tendency when we see these words of blessed and broke, 
uh, to go immediately to the sacrament. And, uh, and there's been some interesting discussions as all of our listeners know around the virtual communion, not virtual communion, uh, whatever. But, uh, but those, those words, uh, those verbs uh, were actually used back at the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter nine. Uh, where you get in 916, uh, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them and gave them to, to the disciples to set before the crowd. So there's this resonance, not just, you know, we're limiting the passage if we just go to the sacrament, as you said, we're, we, we want to go back to, uh, to Jesus' provision of, of that abundant meal uh, that is uh, that is for all people, and so I think making that connection and that promise as well. Moreover, the 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 feeding of the five thousand is prefaced with the mission of the twelve, and and then it's the disciples that are charged with feeding the five thousand. And so there's a kind of uh, I think there's a kind of agency in this as well that it's not just about recognition, but the way in which Luke looks forward, but particularly in, uh, in our time where you were talking about Rolf of sort of taking a little bit more agency about our spiritual growth and our spiritual practices, uh, that, there's a, there, that you hear this charge from Jesus here as well, uh, that of, of, this, of, this, of this recognition that now that we disciples are charged with uh, what Jesus has done. And so uh, maybe some of those connections would be helpful for people as well. Um, it's, it's a sense of recognizing the ordinary of a meal as the time for us to have this discussion. And as Caroline just referenced, we've been um, having um, uh, arguments about whether or not this is a sacrament or it can be a sacrament. And one of the things I found very interesting this time as I read Peter's sermon was that the sermon became invitational. So even though it was critical, it was not done in such a way that it resulted in, in fight. It was done in such a way that it resulted in folks uh, leaning in. I have a question. Uh, I have a question for you, Matt, on this, and for you and Caroline and Joy too. But Matt, uh, as our resident Acts expert, go buy his latest book on Acts. Um, this sentence: um, "Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you, for your children, and all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Him." It seems like a summary of the gospel to me in Acts. Is, um, is that accurate? I also note the connection back to uh, Acts 1, where Jesus says, hey, go, go and social distance yourself. Wait, stay in a room uh, and, uh, for, for, and wait for the promise of the Father. Same word here. I was just wondering what that connection means. Um, well, I I don't know if I'd call it a summary of, of Luke Acts. It's because there's terminology here that we don't see in other places and there's other terms that show up in other places that's not here. But I mean, it's uh, certainly the notion of, of the gift of the spirit is important uh, throughout Acts, um, even in Luke in its own way and way in which the spirit appears in Luke's gospel. The notion of the promise, I think, is maybe the most important thing to note here that We've, we've talked about promising at the end of Luke's gospel in terms of the gift of the spirit. There's this idea of promise here. Peter's, Peter's sermon, I mean, we need to read this in the context of the whole sermon, which in many ways is an exposition of scripture, uh, largely Psalms, in fact. Uh, but also who Peter's talking to here are Jews, and they are dispersed Jews and proselytes from a variety of places. So he's, remember, this is, this is the Pentecost sermon. You, so just for, for listeners say, what do you mean by dispersed Jews? I think I, I unpack that for a minute. Uh, Jews from every nation under heaven, as far as earlier in Acts 2 is how it's, it's rendered. So uh, yeah, Judaism is a, is a multi-ethnic uh, thing, movement, phenomenon in the first century as it is today. 
and, and always has been. So it's, it's the sense of the first big miracle in Acts, so to speak, the Pentecost miracle, the, the, the inbreaking is one that, that kind of, I don't want to say reconstitutes, but it provides a kind of unity, it provides a kind of uh, belonging as a means of fulfilling a promise. I mean, that's, so this is not yet a Gentile story at all, at least in Acts, but it's this idea that first Acts begins with what God has done through Christ is a fulfillment of promises of security, promises of, of home, uh, even though it's not actual land, but it's this idea of a family being um, reunited, so to speak. And that's, I think that's part of what the promise is here. Um, I thought you were going to go this direction, so I'll answer the question I thought you might have asked, but that there's a, um, oh, I, you know, well, Jesus in, with, with Cleopas and the other are, um, he's talking about scripture being fulfilled, but we don't know exactly what scriptures he's looking at. So here, in some ways, we get a glimpse of what that might look like. What are some of the fulfillments? And for Peter in this sermon, it's, this is how we know that this was the Messiah, that this is the one whom God has sent. This is the prophet like Moses, to borrow language from Acts chapter 3. Um, this same one who was crucified but now is raised. And so this idea of fulfillment is really important for Luke and for Acts. Finally, I'll say it's also really important for us, I think, in a time where we feel like we're in some kind of weird space, some really abnormal space or disrupted space right now. And a lot of people are longing to get back to normal. But if we look back at what the story of the Old Testament is, <laughs> right, it's always a question of trying to find new normals. And so I would encourage people if they're going to ask the question of what does it mean that Jesus Christ fulfills aspects of the Old Testament according to Luke and Acts, that's founded on a set of of circumstances or conditions in which we can live securely that's founded on the idea of God's faithfulness and that's always going to look different and so it's uh, to me this sermon is one more way we can ask the question of what does God's faithfulness look like in really new spaces and time um, as opposed to a longing for the golden days or a longing for a return to, you know to something that might not exist anymore that was depressing <laughs> I didn't find it depressing at all thank you oh um, the, the, um, the fact that um, a mega church was created, um, uh, kind of to use that language, 3,000 um, were joined is what I was thinking in terms of the, that it became invitational. Um, and uh, piggybacking on what you were saying, Matt, is that that invitation was for everyone. They were gathered there from all around different, uh, they, were, they were Jews, but they were gathered there from their different cultures and different communities. And uh, they were gathered there to share a familiar holiday, um, but they received what uh, the earlier in the voice uh, verse of uh, the chapter is the promise that the spirit that had been promised is now upon them. And it brings them together uh, in a way where they can come together around this testimony of who Jesus is, and that and that is what Peter is is sharing, at least as at least as I read it. And if there's a difference there, it's not to go back to business as usual. And I read that today to basically say, let's not uh, let's not be just excited because so many people came to. Um, our um, our Easter broadcast, um, but but are they going to be a people that come together across differences in a way that uh, draws attention to itself? I think that's the exciting um, opportunity that this chapter begins to roll out. Caroline, I like I like the question. What should we do? That's the uh, you know that that there is this. Uh, uh, what is, what, what should, now what, 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 what's the response? And I think that's a really real question for today as well, uh, that, that, it, you know, that longing to, uh, so now what, what do we do with this? What, what do we do with this announcement? What do we do with this, uh, this uh, new reality? Uh, and it, and it is uh, something to which we are called and, and uh, a kind of, you know, an kind of embodied and uh, testifying sort of life 
And so uh, I think that's a place I would go if I were going to preach on, on this text is, is kind of unpacking that question with regard to then what, what Peter's, Peter's answer is and, uh, and the way in which we could maybe live that out um, even currently in our situation. Psalm. I was going to say, I thought we might want to turn to the psalm. Ralph, did you want to have something to say about that? Uh, you go right ahead, Joy. Uh, actually, I wanted to look something up. So. Yeah, well, um, first of all, I want to direct folks to the uh, excellent commentary on it on the website by, um, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, if Jason Biassi. Uh, anyway, it's a really well uh, written commentary. Um, it's a psalm of thanksgiving, so it's it's very fitting to think about it in light of uh, both Christ, but our own selves and our own experiences of rescue. Uh, maybe people you know that have survived uh, the disease that is uh, uh, raging in the pandemic, um, or it's also appropriate for people who've experienced the death of a loved one. It, it's spoken itself as the um, by one who has been saved. Um, it says, I love the Lord for, you know, he, um, I'll get the exact quotation here. I'm going to scroll in my Bible. Uh, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and that he's inclined his ear to me. I called upon him, right? And, um, and was saved. Uh, and then it's got this great, uh, what to me is a wonderful thing. And, and, and people can, you can have them, people think about this in their homes. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Uh, what that probably is a reference to, the cup of salvation, is the celebratory meals that we know from Deuteronomy and other places in the Old Testament that, would pe that people would throw after an experience of divine delivery, um, that uh, you would throw a feast um, to give thanks to God. Um, so people, uh, the cup of salvation, again, is not uh, a reference to the sacrament. Obviously, we're in the Old Testament here, so people might not know that, but have them think about what cup would they want to drink out of in their own house? Is there a cup that's special to them for any reason? Um, and um, to lift up that cup in thanks to God for God's blessings. Um, I am, I think everybody knows, certainly you all know, um, back in 1980, which is almost 40 years ago, in November 1980 is when I first got sick with cancer. Every 10 years, I gather my family and um, some uh, our, our dearest friends and uh, throw a feast uh, in Thanksgiving for all of God's blessings these last, now it'll be 40 years. And uh, I, we still invite uh, the widow of uh, someone who, uh, my dad's closest friend at the time who it meant a lot to me. And so we lift up the cup of salvation. Invite people to do that in their homes, uh, again, as part of taking, you know, sort of uh, agency for their own spiritual life. So uh, I'll, I'll say one more thing. There's this really weird line, which is probably the most well-known line in the psalm. Um, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. Um, what's odd about it is, A, first of all, the whole psalm is about being saved from death. So what is this line doing here? And as as directly translated, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful one. That sounds really odd. Um, why, why would the death of God's faithful ones be um, precious to God? Um, Jason in the website takes one tack on it. Um, uh, my interpret you can read about that there. My interpretation of it rather is that is precious um, precious in the sight of the Lord as are his faithful ones as they are dying. That is that God still holds them tenderly even as they are dying, I think is uh, my rendering of that verse. I was thinking, uh, Rolf, as you, as we were talking about spiritual, uh, you know, spiritual practices at home, uh, that that this would be, you know, depending on how people are doing their worship services, uh, but as part of the worship service, that that the invitation to take this, maybe not preach on the psalm, but to take this psalm. And uh, and use it as a prayer throughout the week, uh, so that uh, so that you're kind of getting at uh, some of the things that you're talking about, Rolf, and the um, that uh, the promise of of God's hearing. And so that would be my suggestion: is like actually to 
yeah, pray this every, every day this week. Make that be your spiritual practice for the week. I'm really scared to do this, but I want to sing it. I mean, it makes me think of the song, I love the Lord, he heard my cry. You guys are waiting for me to sing it. I'm waiting for you to sing. I'm waiting for the... I love the Lord, he heard my cry and pity every groan. I'm going to stop right there because I think I hit all those notes and I don't think I can keep doing that. I am never singing again on the podcast. That was beautiful. <laughs> I <laughs> now remain the only person never to have sung that <laughs> turn brainwave. Never that was really beautiful. That <laughs> can we say something about First Peter really quick? Please. Yes. We should. So the, uh, the great thing about this reading <laughs> In my mind this week is it gives us a chance to look at verse 17, which has a reference back to the opening two verses of first Peter, which the lectionary last week skipped over, which this is one of the one of the epistles that is addressed to exiles. It's addressed to people in the dispersion. It's addressed to dispersed peoples, which gives an interesting connection to the Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter two, but it also gives a chance to talk a bit about some of the language we use for Christian identity and what it means to be an exiled people. And there's questions about whether or not First Peter is using this metaphorically or whether it's really talking to a group of Christians who have been cut off in some ways from larger community around them. But it's an interesting way of thinking about the church, especially again, given our new circumstances. We're not an exiled church or maybe an exiled church or something like that. Um, some people are finding great uh, ways to grow spiritually in their homes. Others are really not, and others are very alone, and others are very cut off from Christian community and opportunities to worship as they want to worship. And so uh, maybe just that word, just that notion in which, uh, the, the, the way in which First Peter tries to give hope to a struggling community that is um, dislocated in all sorts of different ways is worth some some meditation i think this week again to help us get a sense of the ways in which god has been faithful in different circumstances and uh, we trust presumably uh hopefully confidently still will prove to be faithful and how exile dislocation is um the disruption of how we do uh, how we sing our songs where we sing our songs where we practice our rituals, what we do is familiar. I really appreciate that, Matt, that bringing us together on that idea of exile. That's where we've been.